be scapegoated for the uh, depression, except bankers, except zombie bankers and hedge fund hyenas. And those come in all flavors. And their center is the city of London. So you tell me, city of London and Wall Street. So uh, I'm saying this. Stop sending us this stuff. We don't want to read it. We don't have time for it. Uh, if you want that, there are plenty of places you can go to get it. Go there. You're not going to hear it here. Now, let's look back at the, the long view. The interesting thing about the past week is we're seeing the end of this period of unipolar <clears throat> U.S. Uh, domination. It's something that Putin had complained about in the Munich speech of 2007. His speech at the United Nations now was more muted, but it didn't have to be loud because the deeds, right, the presence of the MiG-31s and the base near <clears throat> Latakia, all of that was working for him. Let's just go through this idea of world domination, the idea of a world hegemon, and what has that looked, at, looked like, right? This concept only came into existence around 1492 or 1494 uh, with the opening of the Atlantic, Columbus, Magellan, Del Cano. It's fashionable today to have a bad view of these people, <clears throat> but they have undoubtedly heroic aspects. They are long-range navigators. They're a part of Renaissance uh, culture. Um, obviously, you can't blame Columbus for the crimes of the Spanish Empire with uh, slavery and, and, and so forth. But the, we, the postmodernists have completely lost sight of the heroic aspect uh, of these things. You'll remember that in 1494, just as the French were invading Italy and threatening the Vatican, Pope Alexander VI Borgia uh, did the papal line of demarcation that was later codified in the Treaty of Tordesillas between Spain and Portugal, so they divided the world uh, between them, just as Charles VIII of France was invading uh, Italy. So uh, that started the series, and this, this is the 1494, the French in Italy. That's the big event in Machiavelli's life. He says, I never would have believed that the French could have co conquered Italy with chalk alone, marking the doors of the buildings they wanted to seize with no resistance until he turned around and started to go home. So this opens the thing of the great fight between France and Spain over Italy, Charles V of Habsburg on the Spanish and Austrian side, and Francis I, François Ier of France on the French side. Now, the outcome of that is a series of Italian wars that lead up until 1530. 1530 marks the beginning of Spanish world domination. 1530 to 1659, Spain, generally speaking, dominates the world. And we'll tell you how in our final segment. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. We are now going to put the, um, the transition from the unipolar world of 1990 to 2015, the past quarter century, marked by the uh, attempt at unipolar domination by the United States, which has been wrecked in the only way it could have been wrecked from within by neocon fascist madmen, neocon warmongers joined by humanitarian bombers of the the um, Samantha Power stripe. The end of the Italian wars uh, marks the beginning of a period of Spanish world domination. It starts under the Emperor Charles V. He is soon, uh, or relatively soon, by about you know, the middle of the century, he's replaced um, by Philip II. And by 1580 or so, we have the merger of the Portuguese world empire and the Spanish world empire, both then ruled by Philip II from the Escurial near Madrid. Uh, this world domination goes on, as I say, from 1530 to 1659. It is the Spanish who dominate the world ocean. Uh, of course, they have competition from the Dutch and the English. Um, and they, of course, they undergo uh, serious problems, right? We have the... Uh, the fact that the English send troops into the Netherlands to fight the Spanish. These are those wars where Sir Philip Sidney was killed, right? famous uh, Englishman, poet. And uh, 
We've also got the Invincible Armada of 1588, which turns out not to be uh, invincible. So the Spanish have to absorb very significant uh, defeats, and their empire is, is soon in decline, but it hangs on for a very long time. The, the advisor to Charles V, who got this all going, is Gattinara, Gattinara, uh, an Italian advisor. And his slogan was Dominium Mundi, world domination. First unite the Christian world and then dominate and rule the entire world. So world uh, domination, the program of Charles V and then Philip II. So Gattinara is the idea man, uh, along with a couple of others. But the idea is that once you try to have universal monarchy or world domination, you're going to call into existence uh, a coalition of other states to try to cut the hegemon down to size. And as it turned out, this role fell to Cardinal Richelieu of France. So Richelieu is the first guy to say, let's, let's not have Spanish world domination. Uh, he sets up Richelieu sets up an alliance with France and the Netherlands, and Sweden was a great power under Gustavus Adolphus. They were able to penetrate practically down to the Alps. So this is in now in the Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1648. This war actually went on until the Peace of the Pyrenees between France and Spain, 1659. So the, the Spanish and the French keep fighting. For 11 years after the Treaty of Westphalia ends the big 30 Years' War, there's still a kind of a, a significant part of the 30 Years' War that goes on for another, another 10 years. And the idea here is to avoid the universal monarchy of uh, Spain, um, the Spanish create a group of people or bring forth a group of people who I think you can call uh, neocons. And I write about this in my uh, – in my book, uh, Paolo Sarpi, His Networks, Venice, and the Coming of the Thirty Years' War, I see that significant parts of that are online. Nothing I, I guess I can do about that. But it's people like Olivares, Bedmar, Osuna, Gondomar, Zuniga, Villafranca, Oñate. That's a, that's a group of Spanish uh, neocons who essentially say, we've got we to gotta maintain the empire with constant war. And in the meantime, the entire textile system, the sheep, the wool, the looms, everything else is collapsing at home. So the French uh, take over. Now, the, the French, uh, this is now the era of Louis XIV. So Louis XIV, the Sun King, is the dominant guy in Europe and worldwide, I think we can say, from 1659 to 1714. So it's from the end of that extended 30 years war to the end of the War of the Spanish Succession. And in the case of the War of the Spanish Succession, this is uh, William III of England, William of William and Mary, who puts together this grand alliance against the Sun King. So again, a coalition of other states. Uh, so England, the Netherlands, um, Austria, get together against uh, the Sun King. Uh, and that... Uh, it includes, you know, the, the takeover of England in 1688 by William and Mary, uh, all kinds of stuff. France and Spain stay together. They try to carry out the unification of those two monarchies, right? The idea was the Pyrenees exist no longer, but it doesn't work. And by 1714, the big winners are the British. So we then have a very long period, all the way up to 1943. So from 1714 to 1942, 43 or thereabouts, the British tend to dominate the world. And after Trafalgar, right, the naval defeat of Napoleon, they have about a century of, uh, you know, very marked, practically multipolar, but not quite uh, world domination. So that ends really in the, in the Second World War. Purists may say there's a period in the middle of the Second World War where Nazi Germany may have gotten to uh, world domination. We, we don't need to get into that fine a detail. But from 1943 to 1990, you've got the relative domination of the U.S., but of course a strong Soviet Union with the Warsaw Pact and a powerful coalition of states. So it's, it's not really a unipolar world, although there is uh, the hegemony tendency of the United States. And then we get down to the collapse of the Soviet empire, which was a disaster, 
didn't have to happen. You could have kept it together. Let the Baltics go. Let some people uh, let Georgia go if they want to go. A few others. But other than that, you could have kept it with uh, Ukraine and Belarus and Central Asia. But no, uh, the uh, the push from the CIA and from Washington and so forth, this was very strong. So a period from 1990 to 2015 of really unipolar uh, U.S. world domination. It has been poorly administered. Uh, if you wanted to keep that, you should have made that into a golden age. And needless to say, this was not what the neocons had in mind. Look at how they wasted all these advantages, deindustrializing the U.S., attacking Iraq in, in 1991, then again in 2003, this entire 9-11 exercise used then as a pretext for the Afghan war, constant meddling, the bombing of Libya, the, the meddling in Syria, the color revolutions, it's all a uh, terrible, terrible administration. We can thank the neocons for whatever bad events go with this uh, transition. But if we get rid of the neocons, the events really don't have to be bad. What we're looking at, uh, as I've tried to point out, we should act actively um, seek a condominium with Russia, a two-party world domination or administration, with the British and the French being brought along by the U.S. and the Security Council, and China being uh, persuaded to join in by Russia. With this, we could uh, dictate an end to the war in Syria. We could dictate a solution to the uh, Ukrainian situation, which would essentially be conforming with the issues, the interests of Russia and the United States, if, they, if reasonably understood, not by neocons, but by actual uh, classical Americans, uh, we could say, here. We would have no problem getting along with Russia. Same thing for the Middle East, right? The two-state solution imposed from the outside, because the world is now tired of the menace of third world war coming out of this left to politicians who simply... Okay, okay.